Minneapolis. So great to be here. We've had a really good time this weekend, and uh, we're going to end off with a subject that is so applicable to all of us. And we've, as was already said, we're talking about relationship. God made us for two purposes. God made us to work. He gave us the earth, and he wants us to take care of the earth and subdue the earth and take care of it. And the other thing was he wanted us to have relationship, first of all with him, but also with each other. Those are the two basic purposes God made us for. And typically we get the work thing because if we don't work, we don't eat, right? Right? And sometimes relationships can go by the wayside. So all weekend, Friday night and Saturday, we've been talking about things that block relationships. We talked a lot about marriage. And we have a, a situation in, the, in our church today where we have 50% divorce rate. And it's because they can't connect at a heart level. And so we've been talking about that all weekend. And here's a chart that um, we kind of looked through and Emotional issues and spiritual issues that block relationships. And this morning, we're going to look at one of the hardest areas to deal with. I, I spend most of my time uh, counseling couples. Done that for 17 years. We pastored for 15 years and moved into this ministry of helping people on an intense level. And when we come up to this subject... It's one of the hardest things to deal with. In fact, what I have seen is the worse a problem this is, the less a person will see it. And this is whole area of pride. And that's a spiritual issue. Emotional issues, Jesus came to heal. And we all, we all get hurt with things. Uh, spiritual issues take repentance. If we're bitter, I need to repent of that. And extend forgiveness. God gives us grace to do that. So this morning we're going to look at this area of pride. And I want to go back to the very, the passage has already been alluded to, uh, the very first time this word was mentioned in Scripture. And we want to go right back when the Israelites were coming out of the, uh, the land of Egypt. And Moses brought them through. So we're going to read this here. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains, captains also are drowned in the sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. So they got through the Red Sea and they, they broke out into spontaneous worship. They praised him for who he was. They expressed to him who he was. They described him, a man of war. They focused on him in the greatness of his excellency. This word, excellency, simply means to focus on, to exalt, to lift up. That's what that word excellency means. And they focused on him and praised him for his excellency. There's another place in the Bible where this same word is used, and it's in Proverbs, and it's this one. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That word excellency and pride are exactly the same word in the original language. Excellency, when we focus on him. And we've done that in our worship this morning already, haven't we? We've focused on him. When we focus on ourselves, God calls that pride. Exactly the same word. Pride is when I lift up myself. I focus on me. Pride is where I have to control somebody. 
My opinions, my desires, my thoughts are primary. I become the central of everything, and everything revolves around me. The Bible uses terms to describe a person that's proud, selfish, boastful, haughty, high-minded, arrogant, conceited, an exaggerated opinion of oneself. If you sum up all those things, pride becomes a self-focus. Or I think about me. Let's look for a minute at the origin of pride. We've looked at this diagram different times this weekend, and God started uh, creating things, and he made angels. And one of the angels, there's a, just a history is divided up into three 2,000 periods with the flood happening and then the Jewish nation starting and Christ coming. But in the beginning, God first created angels. And angels, the angels watch God create everything. One of those angels' name was Lucifer. And uh, he is the origin of pride. Let's read about it in Isaiah. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Satan, his name was changed to Satan, but his name was Lucifer. He led angels in worship around God's throne, and total focus was on God, and he turned all that, and he started focusing on me. I don't want to be under God's authority. I want to kind of do my own thing. And God calls that pride. And God said, you want to ascend to the heights, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest pits, the depths of the pit. And so Lucifer was sentenced to a lake of fire. He's not there yet, but he is going there. That's where his destiny is. So really, pride is independence from God. It's a focus on self. We, God has given us the word of God. When you go to a satanic church, they have a Bible. If you look at our Bible, everything is focused on him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then others. It's upward and it's outward. That's, that's what our focus should be. And worshiping God is the primary thing. I would have thought if you'd have read a satanic Bible that it would, the whole focus would be on focusing on Lucifer, Satan, worshiping him. I've never read a satanic Bible. I've never even seen one. I'm going by what other people have said about the satanic Bible. I understand there's not one reference to worshiping Satan in the entire satanic Bible. Not one reference. The whole focus of the satanic Bible is whatever you want to do, do it. Deny yourself no pleasure. It's all about you. Life revolves around you. That's the satanic Bible. It's a self-focus. How does pride manifest itself? Well, we live in a very me-oriented society. It's all about me. Even you can read Christian books, and it's how, it's, start here, how does God relate to me? Mm. You know what? He has a program. History goes in a straight line, and it's going to end at a certain point in time, or we're going to move into the next thing God has for us. It's all about him. It's not how does God fit into my life. It's how does my life fit into his program and what he's doing, right? Amen. That's what we want to be thinking. It's a self-focus. Pride affects our speech, our attitudes, our decisions, our priorities, our ministries. Someone said God could do amazing things in a church if nobody cares who gets the credit. I had a couple in my office once, and this is how it affects relationships. And, and uh, they came a long way to get to my office. 
We got to the last hour, and I've been fighting this whole thing with pride all week. Lots of things to deal with, but this pride became so huge, you couldn't hardly get anything else done. And so we got to the last hour, and finally the lady said, you know what? I've had enough of this. I'm sick and tired of this. I'm not doing one more thing until he, and she gave a list of things he better straighten out. You know what he said? Oh, yeah? I'm not doing one more thing until you. <laughs> not a good way to end a whole week of counseling. Well, I kind of just sat back in my chair, and I said, well, I think you guys might as well get a divorce. Now, they came 3,000 miles. I wanted to, now, divorce to me is never the answer. I just wanted to get their attention. So I just said that, and I just didn't say anything more. And finally they said, you mean we came all this way to hear you say we should divorce? Well, I said, you have set up an impossible situation. You're not going to move until he, you're not going to move until she. That's impossible. Somebody has to start humbling themselves. Who's going to be first? In many ways, I've seen it. The, the bigger a problem pride is, the less we're going to see it. And they couldn't see it. And I'm sad to say they left that way. I hope God was able to use someone else to get to them. But you know what? I can talk about pride in my own life. You know, I, I remember at the end of my teenage years, I had some things I needed to get settled, and I went to Bible college, and, and I really came to a place of dealing with a lot of that stuff. And you know what? Life became so wonderful for me. I didn't have any problems. It was just wonderful. I, I, wow, God was blessing. I didn't have any problems. And then I got married. <laughs> and then I realized how utterly selfish, self-focused, and prideful I really was. If you want to find out who you really are, yeah, get married. And I got pride in my family, I got to say that, both sides. Uh, let me just explain that a bit. I grew up in the church. Um, my grandparents on my, on my mother's side uh, were married 72 years. Now, when you're married 72 years, you start getting letters from the prime minister. Whoa, that's just pretty special, and it is. They never once in 72 years celebrated their wedding anniversary. They had 10 children. Not one of them knew when mom and dad were married. My sister actually found out not too many years ago. I mean, my grandparents were long gone before we found out when they were married. And she happened to be in New Brunswick or Nova Scotia. We knew they were married there, and she had time to kill because she was there on business with her husband. And so she went to the archives and found it. Mm, cool. Got married. This date. And then inadvertently found out Aunt Vera, the firstborn, came along six months later. <laughs> so... You just want to cover that up, you know. You don't want to talk about your wedding anniversary because somebody might start doing the math <laughs> instead of just facing it. You know, kids, we blew it. We, we should not have done this. This was not right. No, just bury it. That's my mom and dad's. That's, that's my mom's side, my dad's side. We all grew up in the church. I saw more scrapping about who's going to play the piano and who, who put most money into this thing. Who should play it the Sometimes I wonder why I'm still in church. 
but pride on both sides. So I have told my children, you know, you're going to struggle in this area. But you know what? It's like any other area. We don't have to succumb to it, and we can have victory over it. Okay? So there are consequences. Now, we've been talking a lot about whatever we think and whatever we do, there's always consequences, good and bad. What are the consequences? Some of the consequences if we allow pride to come in. Well, pride, first of all, brings destruction. It brings destruction. We saw what it did to Lucifer. He focused on himself. You can go, and then Adam and Eve focus. I want to be wise like God. So Lucifer convinced her she should look after herself. I want to be wise. It brings destruction. Um, there's a verse there. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud. I have to say, I have very good friends and uh, he simply would not deal with his pride. And they were a homeschooling family. Everything was going good. The, the, the scripture was the top priority for them to teach their children. But he wouldn't deal with his pride. And I watched that home disintegrate. And it's shattered now. Pride brings destruction. It also brings distance from God. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. We talked about getting into people's hearts this week, and as I help people solve marriage problems or even personal problems, really that's what marriage problems are, unresolved personal problems. And when we help people that way, I want to get into their heart, and I want them to get connected with Jesus at a heart level. Because a lot of times we know a lot of things in our head, but we don't get to our hearts on it. And if I can't get someone connected with Jesus, oftentimes I'll start, I'll just ask questions of Jesus. You know, I'll have them repeat after me, Lord, what, what is going on? Why are you distant from me right now? And oftentimes Jesus will show them we have a pride issue here. Sometimes they're angry at God, but oftentimes it's pride. Pride brings disgrace. When pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. Um, the whole story of the Titanic that happened many years ago and went down. Um, I understand that when they were making the second movie of the Titanic... And I've never even seen the second movie, actually. I've seen parts of it, but I've never seen the whole thing. And when they were making that movie, when the ship started going down, they started portraying all the men fighting over who's going to have the boats because the men wanted to get in the boats. It didn't matter about the women and children. They were fighting over them themselves. And somebody who was there went to the director and says, why, why are you portraying this? Because that's not what happened. The men were of one accord and one mind. The women and children go first. There was no fighting about it. You know what the director said? He said, I I'm quite aware of that. That's what happened. But if we made this new movie that way, our people today aren't going to relate to it. What a sad commentary on our society. Pride brings disgrace. It also brings failure. A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. Well, you can say, well, I know some very proud people, and they got lots of money. You know what? <laughs> God writes last chapters, doesn't he? You can go through the scriptures. And I don't like to use the word that God reacts because I don't think God reacts to anything. But he seems to come down harder on pride than almost anything else. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't even a believer, didn't pretend to follow God, but built this monstrosity of a palace. And they were the top of the world at that time. And one day, Nebuchadnezzar walking around the top of the palace. Look what I have done. Well, that was enough. And God struck him with insanity. 
and humbled him. I always say, you know what? If we struggle with pride, you want to deal with it yourself. Because if we wait for God to do it, it gets messy. And I've, I've done it both ways. It's better when you do it yourself. Okay? It brings failure. We can go to the New Testament. King Herod, again, an unbeliever. But people started worshiping him and saying and worshiping him, you are God. And he accepted it. And this God turned his heart to stone. So this whole thing about pride is a pretty big thing with God. God resists the proud. What a reason to get deal with pride in our life. We all need his grace. But he gives more grace, therefore he says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And we will not have grace if we allow pride to take over. It destroys relationships. I was in my garden one day. Proverbs 13, 10 says, By pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well-advised is wisdom. I'm working in my garden, and I got a phone call from a couple that had a fair bit of counseling. And uh, she got on the phone, and she was sobbing uncontrollably. And she's had it with this marriage. I'm sick and tired of this. We're, I'm going to get a divorce. We're, it just doesn't work. And on and on and on and on she went, and I just listened. And this is the way I handled it. It, it. They had counseling and they understood this. So I handled it this way. And she, she wound down a little bit. And I says, well, what you have is two people so focused on themselves, you can't care about the other person. And she got kind of quiet. And I says, well, what would happen if you just forgave him right now for what he's all wound up against and the things that he said to you. And you forgave and you walked around that and you started to care about him and what he's hurting with right now. You know what she said? Um, if I did that, it'd be all solved. Yeah, I think so. And she thought about that, she got so excited. And she says, why didn't I think of that? I don't know. So she was about 15 minutes away from us, and um, I was going by their place a few days later, and I just dropped in and, and uh, see how they're doing. And so she opened the door, and I could tell in two seconds that she had done that because there was total harmony in the home again. By pride comes nothing but strife. It destroys relationships. Well, there's some directives in the Bible also about, um, oh, one more thing here. God will not tolerate the proud. And that's the, that's the uh, incident there where we talked about King Herod. God doesn't tolerate the proud. But then there are biblical directives about, about humility. First of all, never draw attention to your own achievements. Let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Then there's not, we're told not to view ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but think soberly. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Always give God the credit. You know, everything we have, God has gifted everybody here with different gifts. And we function as a church together with all those gifts and different personalities. But you know what? Everything God gives us, we owe to him. The next breath we just breathe right now is a gift from God. And we need to, need to give him credit for everything. Then there's focusing on loving others. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Here's a question for you that I, that I need to ask myself all the time, too. In the last 24 hours, how much time have we spent thinking about ourselves? What I need, what I'm doing, 
what I want. And how much time have we spent thinking about those around us that we love? How much time have we spent caring about them and thinking about them? And you know what? Whenever I teach and preach and so on, I'm always preaching to myself. Because everything that I'm showing you and teaching you, <laughs> I have to apply to myself. And um, some of you think because you're up here speaking about all this stuff and you counsel all the time, you must be perfect. Okay, let's just straighten that one out. Have a, have a conversation with my wife after. And she will tell you, no, we're still working on stuff too. Okay, so I'm applying the same things to my life that I'm talking about here. Reject every thought that exalts itself above God. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Replace pride with humility. Again, that verse. But he gives more grace. What do we need today? What do we need today? What do we need today? We need more grace, don't we? We need more grace. We need grace today. We can't go on yesterday's. We can't bank on tomorrow's. We need more grace today. Well, you know what? When it comes to dealing with pride, just how do you do with that? I, 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 I've seen helping people in my own life. Blanket prayers kind of don't work. When we pray, God, could you just take away all my pride? Just take it away. Well, how I've observed, that's kind of a useless prayer. <laughs> it doesn't work. What we have to do is get right down to the nitty-gritty. And how am I personally demonstrating pride? So to help a person do that, I give them this sheet. Do you want to hand these out now or after? Maybe we just, not, yeah, probably do that right now. Whoops. Why don't you go ahead and do that? Thank you. Here, here's some ways on this sheet, and I'm just going to start going through them here uh, on the overhead as well, identifying pride. Um, first of all, there's two kinds of pride, basically. There's obvious pride, and there's hidden pride. Obvious pride is, well, I'm the best hockey player that ever walked in Ontario. If somebody said that, that would be a very prideful, conceited statement, wouldn't it be? I mean, look at that person. Oh, he's got a pride problem. That's obvious pride. But we can also have hidden pride. Now, let me give you an example. When I was 13, I was tall. I was skinny. I heard every skinny joke. And if I walked into a group of people, the last thing I wanted to do was have any attention. I didn't want people to look at me because... If I walked into a group, I wasn't thinking about you. I'm thinking, what are you thinking about me? <laughs> That's what I'd be thinking. And I began to realize, looking at this whole pride thing, you know what? A very self-conscious person, like I was, who didn't want any attention, I wouldn't say anything. If I just faded into the woodwork, I would be just as happy. But I started to realize that self-consciousness is really a pride issue. Why? Because I wasn't thinking about you in the group. I was thinking about what you're thinking about me. I'm focused on me. What do you think of me? I make sure my hair is looking right. and you know, Self-focus. That's hidden pride. Or sometimes people, all they do is focus on pain. Why did this have to happen to me? and we focus inside. That's also a pride issue. So there's different ways we can demonstrate pride. So here's some things, and you can see on your sheet there, um, there's two columns, okay? Now what I have a couple do, or even a single person, I have them go down and just check off things where you struggle with pride. Just check it off, okay? And then I have them go through and I have them evaluate their spouse and just check off what, how, what pride do you see in them. And I always tell a couple, if your spouse checks off something for you that you didn't check off for yourself, just assume you have it. 
If you fight it, add another one to the bottom. <laughs> because you know what? Moral stuff, you know what? You know you did it or you didn't do it. But we can have a pride issue and not know it. Be very blinded to it. And like I said, the worse a problem it can come, become in our life, the less we can see it. So let's just walk through these real quick. The first one is there, desire to be recognized and appreciated. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with being recognized and appreciated. And we should recognize and appreciate each other. I've, I've used this illustration before. If, if I taught Sunday school, what a thing to do, because it's an amazing thing to teach children, isn't it? If I taught Sunday school for 40 years, and I never missed a Sunday in 40 years, and it came time I just couldn't do any more, so I, I had to move away from that. And nobody says anything. I retire from it. Well, you know what? If that did happen, shame on somebody that should have recognized that. You know, we need to recognize each other for what we do. We should. But we don't always get recognized. So what are we going to do with that? I got a choice to make here. I could go. 40 years. 40 years. And nobody gives a rip. Who am I thinking about? It's all about me. I could say also, Lord, you know what I did, and I did it for you anyway. I'm just going to leave it with you and let it go. Some of these things, there's nothing wrong with them. It's when it becomes a focus. Second one there. Hurt feelings when others are promoted, but I'm overlooked. Focus on myself rather than others. Blaming others for their failures. One of the things I want every couple or single person that comes into my office, I'm just going to accept them. I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to blame them for anything. I'm not going to say, what in the world did you do that for? No, I'm just going to accept them. I'm not going to blame them for what they've done. Becoming defensive when criticized. Oh, there's a good one. Do I do that? There's always, probably in every criticism we ever get, there's going to be nuggets of truth, even if it's over-exaggerated and someone's just trying to nail us to the wall. There's probably something we could take out of that. Concern what other people think of me. Some of us live our lives around what everybody thinks of them. Difficult in admitting when I have failed another person. Do I struggle with that? View of others as lower than myself. Desire for others to meet my needs. Desire for self-advancement. Desire for success apart from God's blessing or direction. Refusal to give up personal rights. Sometimes we think we have a right that if I'm a Christian, I deserve to be happy. <laughs> Happiness is one thing. Joy is another and when we're going through trials, we're not happy, but we still have joy and peace. Desire to control others. Talking most often about myself when talking with others. And you know, I, when I checked this off the first time, I didn't check that one off. But I started thinking about it. And for the next few conversations I was having with people, if I was sitting down with Travis and just start talking, I, had, I just kind of stepped aside, and what am I doing? Now look, look at the conversation. Do that in your head, you know. And when the other person was talking, I couldn't believe how much I was thinking about what I was going to say next. Instead of really focusing in on what he or she was saying. So I had to check that one off, too. <laughs> Drawing attention to my abilities and achievements. Feeling sorry for myself because I'm not appreciated. Focus on my knowledge and experience. Self-sufficient attitude, excluding God 
or others. Well, those are just some, this isn't an exhaustive list, but it helps us to get narrowed down. What little things, what little ways am I demonstrating pride? And here's what's going to happen. You start dealing with the little things, the big thing takes care of itself because we demonstrate pride in little things, even in relationships, and we got to deal with those. So I have a couple or a single uh, check off what they they know is a problem with them and pray through these things. Lord, I acknowledge and I renounce my pride as evidenced by my whatever it is. I ask your forgiveness and choose to humble myself and respond with a proper attitude. And I encourage a person, whatever they check off, to, to go through that every day for 30 days, just in your private time with God. Now, there's no, there's no um, particular value in repeating a prayer. But in this case, if you... Um, are talking most often about yourself in a conversation, and that's one of the things you check off, and you pray through that every day, and just become... You know what's going to happen? You're going to become very conscious of that when you're talking to people. It's just going to come to your mind. And then you've got a choice to make. Am I going to think about myself, or am I really going to key into what the other person is saying? So there's value in that. Well, we are told in Scripture to humble ourselves. And again, if we don't humble ourselves, God will humble us. And again, it's more fun when we do it ourselves. So I'm going to give you two ways here that we can really humble ourselves. One, well, that we can go through that sheet and work on those things. But two other things here. And the first one is this. By learning to live with a clear conscience. Our conscience is a function of our heart. And we want to live with a clear conscience. What is a clear conscience? Uh, in Acts 24, 16, a clear conscience is one that is without offense toward God and toward man. And here's a, Verse in First Timothy. Timothy, my son, this is instructions from Paul. Here are my instructions to you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. Cling to your faith and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences, and as a result, their faith has become shipwrecked. Shipwrecked. Can I give you a personal illustration? I know myself the best. Okay. When I was when I was in grade ten, and it illustrates this whole thing of clearing your conscience. When I was in grade ten, I took an auto mechanics class class. I, I don't remember a thing. Because I can't fix my car on anything. Much. During that year, we worked in pairs and we had projects to do concerning fixing cars. So we had a list of about 50 little projects we had to do, and we had to work in pairs. Had a sheet to fill out, did the job, fill the sheet out, hand it in. And so my friend that I was working with came to me one day. He says, Brammy, that's what they called me in high school, Brammy, um, I filled out five of these sheets. We didn't do the jobs, but let's just get it over with and just get it done. I handed them in already. I says, I'm a Christian at that time, and I... I says, no, I can't. Brammy, don't worry about it. And he shut me down. And I didn't have the courage to make that right. So I just let it go. Well, God started convicting me. That was now on my conscience. And he wanted me to go to the teacher, made it very clear to me, and clear that up. I didn't want to do that. I didn't even really do it, but now I'm getting credit for marks that I didn't even do. And so I argued with God about that, and uh, he, he didn't really buy my arguments, but I found new ones, okay? I wasn't going to humble myself. I just was too... I didn't, I didn't want to do that. So I, I just didn't. 
But I became very guilty about that. And I had all the reasons. And in the long run, they wouldn't have affected my final mark very much. Anyway, so what is the big deal with this? And for four years, I argued with God about that. And everything stops in my Christian life. I came to points where I says, well, this is just Satan making me, give me a hard time. Okay, all kinds of stuff. Finally, I felt so guilty. I'm such a little thing. And I remember one time my sister was playing the piano and practicing her piano, and I went by and I said something, and I don't even know what it was now, but she turned around to me and she says, she just screamed at the top of her lungs, what is wrong with you? And it was like she hit me with a sledgehammer. I knew exactly what it was. I was feeling so guilty that I wasn't obeying God. So I came to a point, okay, I'm not even sure anymore if this is God talking or Satan. So I says to God, God, you're all powerful. I, I, I got to I gotta deal with this thing. You're all powerful. So if this is really of you, what I'm going to do is um, wait for you to set up a time with me and the teacher. And if you set up a time... It just happens, and it's just me and him, all alone, nobody else around, because I'm too embarrassed. Then I will deal with it. So I settled it, and I knew that would never happen. <laughs> and one day, I'm feeling pretty good now, because this is off my conscience. I walk into school one day. I walk down the hall, and it's a long hall. And here comes this teacher. And I actually turned around. Where did everybody go? <laughs> and God set it up. And I'd like to tell you that I stopped him and I talked to him. But I didn't. I just walked on by. I'm not doing that. So I go through all the cycle again. Those four years of my life were the worst years of my life. Such a little thing, but it was just an obedience thing, and I wasn't being obedient. I came to a point again, so sick and tired of this. I remember I got so upset about this. I, I, I dreamed once that I turned to God. And I said, God, I want you to get out of my life. I don't want anything to do with you. I woke up real quick. God, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. It was just a dream. That's how it was bothering me so much. So I says, okay, God. You are all powerful. Set it up again and I'll do it. So he did it again in a different situation. And then I'd love to tell you that I walked up to him, and, but I didn't. That was it. I'm not dealing with this. I'm just not. I'll go to Bible college. Graduated from high school, went to Bible college, and every time I opened the Bible, God would say, so when are you going to deal with that? Okay, then, we won't read the Bible. <laughs> you talk about shipwreck. I remember getting to a point in my life at Bible college, laying on my bed, looking at the yellow brick wall, and everything was so phony to me. I mean, the, the professors, I knew some of their personal life. They were phonies. All the kids that were around me, just hypocrites. And God was somewhere gone. For one little thing, I wouldn't clear my conscience. And I could see my life was shipwrecked. But you know what? God is so gracious. <laughs> and he took me. We had chapel every day. And a speaker came in, I couldn't even tell you who it was today, and he talked about this very thing, about just being obedient. And I was sitting somewhere in the audience, but it was like everybody was gone, and this guy is speaking right to me. And God was being gracious, and he just told me, you, you, you got to deal with this. I'm not sure where it's going to go from here. Well, that, that was it. And we sang that song to end 
the meeting. Trust and obey, for there's no one. Every time I hear that song now, I go back there, and it was great. I mean, it's just a great, great feeling because God was still chasing me. And I did go back. I didn't care anymore who heard or who what. didn't matter. I took a weekend and went home, went into the school and knocked on his door, took him out of class and say, I just explained everything. And then while I was there, something else came up with another teacher that I had a real problem with. And God says, you should probably talk to her too. <laughs> so I went and talked to her. And uh, I walked out of the school that day. And for four years, it was a cloud between me and God, and it just cleared. Can I follow it up with one other time? Again, it's a pride issue. I was pastoring at this time, and we lived out in the country. Across the road from us lived uh, Old Order Mennonite, horse and buggy. And they would come and use our phone. They didn't have a phone. I never figured out how that worked. They could use our phone, but they couldn't have a phone. Anyway, I'll leave that where it is. <laughs> so we were happy to have him use our phone. I says, he says, what can I, no, I won't take any payment. Just come and plow our garden. So we plowed our garden with the horse and buggy, not the buggy, but the horse and the plow. So he came one Saturday morning. Now, Saturday morning is my sleep-in morning, okay? So he came one Saturday morning, knocked on the door. I don't know, it was 6.30 or 7 o'clock. And um, I have this thing. I grew up, I was always shamed for sleeping in. The expression my dad always used was, people die in bed, you know. <laughs> so I just always felt shame for any time you slept in. So I wake up, and I'm immediately shamed because I'm caught in bed. So I ran down, threw my pants on, ran downstairs, opened the door, and this old order of Mennonite standing there, big beard, and he says, ah, I caught you in bed, didn't I? And I said, nope. That wasn't even premeditated. <laughs> I just said it. He used the phone, and uh, he left. And he goes out the laneway, and I'm watching him, big bay window, gets in his buggy, goes down the road, and God says to me, so, you lied to him. <sighs> yeah. So what are you going to do about it? I'm not, oh man, come on. <laughs> and I wasn't going to go talk to him. And God brought back to my mind those four years. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to waste another minute on this one. I get in my car, went into his barn, crossed the road, got in front of him, milk on the cow. And I says, Elias, I just got to tell you something. You know what? When you came over this morning, I lied to you. And I, I just had to come and confess to you. I was in bed. He stood up and looked at me and said, Oh, confession's good for the soul. <laughs> but you know what? I walked out again a free man. We have to clear our conscience. So here's a question for you guys. And I have to ask myself this. I'm telling you, I was pastoring when that happened, right? Is there anyone that I need to clear my conscience with? Just ask the Lord that. If you start fighting it, think about a buggy going down there. <laughs> That's one way we can um, humble ourselves. It takes humility to go and confess something like that. But here's the interesting thing. The devil can put thoughts in your mind. Yeah, if I tell him I lied, then he'll probably just think I'm a crazy guy and pastoring. You know what? The fact that I did it, he trusts me with anything. That's the truth. I also realized I wasn't perfect. Here's another way. We can clear our conscience. And that's simply by putting Matthew 5, 23 and 24 into practice, which basically says this. If you know your brother has something against you or you have something against your brother, there's two verses in different places that go back either way. If you know somebody has something against you, 
go talk to them. If you know that you have something against somebody, go talk to them. Doesn't matter how big or small it is. He just wants us to make it right. Let's take it that I have something that I um, have to make right. Now, if this happens all the time in your marriage, I think it happens all the time with so many situations. And if we learn to humble ourselves here, we're, we're going to be dealing with pride in our life. And so I'm going to give you three phrases, about ten words, that you can use to humble yourself every time you know you need to make something right. You have a spat with your spouse. How can you make that right? And the first thing is this. To look at a person and say, I was wrong. <laughs> when you do that, you're accepting responsibility. But to admit, here, I was wrong in this. And to look him in the eye. That's repentance. Taking responsibility. And then we want to go on. We want to express our sorrow. Yeah, I can't, I can't believe I said that, but I want you to know I'm sorry. It's just not appropriate for me to say that or do that or whatever the thing is. Never assume forgiveness. Humbly ask, would you choose to forgive me? If we go to, you should forgive me for this, and you haven't repented, accepted responsibility, expressed your sorrow, that's a pride thing. We should never assume forgiveness. The question is asked, would you choose to forgive me? Because you know what? Sometimes people can't. Sometimes people can say, well, I'll think about that. And that's okay. Sometimes people need a little time to forgive. And we can accept that if we're humble. Sometimes we're asking forgiveness for something, and when we ask, would you choose to forgive me, it gives them a chance to say, well, um, you know, I want to forgive you, but that wasn't what really hurt me. Oh, how did I hurt you? Then you go back again. Okay, I was wrong in that whole attitude, too. I, I'm sorry. I, I wish I could do it over. I can't do it. Would you choose to forgive me for that? The other thing it does when you ask the question, it brings the whole thing to closure. Sometimes you can say, yeah, I should have screwed for that. <laughs> we, we just slur. You know what? Let's just square it up. I was wrong. First time I taught this in a seminar, I was in Kitchener. And I had about 50 couples there. And we're just going to break for dinner. And um, I said, I'm a kind of a practical guy. So why don't we just take this last thing we talked about and let's just be practical with it. So what I'd like you to do, I said to all the, uh, the husbands, I want you to just turn to your wife right now, hold her hands, Look into her eyes. Why is that so important to look into the eyes? Because the eyes are the windows of your heart, the windows of your soul. And if you're going to make something right, you have to get to their heart. And if you humble yourself with these three things, you'll get to their heart. It takes a pretty hard cookie not to bite on this if you're humbling yourself. So I said, I just want you to turn to your wife, look her in the eye, and I want you to just say the words. We're not thinking about an issue. We don't want anything to break out here. Just s practice the words. So, I was shocked. About a third of the guys did that. And it was fun. And they looked into their wife's eyes and said those three statements. Another third, well, they had something to find in their pocket, and they were looking around, and they, they weren't going to do that. And another third just stared at me. Make me. <laughs> and I began to realize how hard this really is. I know how hard it is for me. 
So I encourage you to do that. I was wrong. I am sorry. Would you choose to forgive me? Whatever church leaders have, and I'm talking to myself, if we don't humble ourselves, we don't have much. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, this is love, humbling yourself and bringing healing to another person. If we don't have that, we can't humble ourselves, we'll shoot ourselves. Our pastor um, that's there at our church now, been there 10 years, he was there about six months and he was preaching, and he, he made some offhanded comment one Sunday morning. And I, I could just feel half the congregation just bristle. You don't say. And he just set half the congregation off, with, which was just kind of a really proud statement. So I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, should I talk to him after about that? Because I, I felt the same way, like, whoa. And so um, I wrestled with that, and so I uh, talked to people after church, and he talked to people, and I never did get connected with him, and so I didn't say anything. The next Sunday, he got up to preach, and he said, um, before I start, I just wanted to talk about something I said last week. When I said, and he made the statement, he said, somebody came up to me right after church, the service was done, and told me how offended they were that I had said that. And you know what? I realized right away how wrong that was. It was just wrong to say that. And I want you to know, I, I'm just saying to you as a congregation that I'm sorry for that. And I, and I do ask you to forgive me. You know, that took him about total, about 90 seconds but the whole congregation just relaxed. Never heard a thing about that since, and he moved on. You know what? That Sunday, I did go up and talk to him. I found him, and I says, you know what? I don't know if you know how significant that was just to do that. And just clear your conscience and just own that. To me, it was watershed. If he hadn't have, his whole ministry would have started taking a different direction. When I was in Bible college, I'll never forget this. One of the professors took a, a dorm meeting with all the guys, and he was going to talk about the three sins of preachers. Never forgot this. He says, the biggest sin of preachers is pride. Never forgot that. Never forgot that. We need to just humble ourselves as leaders. As a pastor, I had one other situation. I'll close with this. Um, guy came into our church. He's a very intellectual guy. He studied theology. He could come at theology from any angle. He's just a real mind guy. And not a bad thing, but that's where he was at. And... Uh, he began to go down a strain of theology that I wouldn't say is heresy, but it wasn't where we were at, okay? And, and to get really involved in our church, it wasn't where we were. He wasn't going to fit in there. And so he was there about a year, and I um, said to him one Sunday, we were just going to, we were just, after the service, people are still milling around, and, and we were good friends. And I said to him, I'll call him Jim, I said, Jim, you know, maybe you should find a, another church that you can uh, go to where you can really fit in. And I, I wasn't being negative because we were good friends. And I just knew he wasn't going to. So however I said that, he just got so angry. He took a strip off me up, down one side, down the other side. And I'm talking, he was yelling at me. All the people were there, and he just ran out the door and just slammed the door shut. And I stood there, and I thought, Bob, 
Do you learn anything? He came out of a church that he was spiritually abused, and I just rejected him again. I know better than that. And I had to make it right with him. But this was the kind of guy, if I'd have gone to his place, he would have sicked his German shepherd on me. And he did have a big German shepherd. He, he was just that kind of guy. So I knew I didn't want to go to his place. Uh, if I answered, if I phoned him, this is before you could even have call display. Now I'm dating myself. Um, so as soon as he found out it was me, he wouldn't even talk. So the only thing I thought I could do is phone him and just pray that um, his wife doesn't answer the phone because I want to have the first few words with him. So <laughs> I phoned him up, and I wrote out exactly what I wanted to say. I didn't want to blow it again. He didn't know I was risk fault because I just wanted to get to his heart and make right what I had done. And again, God answered. God answered. He had him answer the phone, and that was good. And our first words were, Jim, I was so wrong in what I did and what I said to you. And I just want you to know I'm sorry for that. I just, there's no excuse for it. It was just wrong, and I am sorry. Would you choose to forgive me for that? And he did. And we're still good friends. And you know what? He did move on, and he found another church where he fit right in. And uh, that was wonderful, and we're still good friends. This is a very, very powerful thing. We're told, again, to sum up, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. And so here's some very practical ways that we can actually humble ourselves. And whatever God has brought to your mind right now, just go and do it and make it right. Clear your conscience and live with a clear conscience. So let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful. You showed us the ultimate example of humbling yourself by sending your own son and allowed the thing created to spit in the face of who created them. And you humbled yourself to the point of death. Why? Because you loved us so much. We're so grateful for that example. Lord, would you guide us as we deal with pride issues in our lives? Give us the courage to humble ourselves. And I ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.